All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Growing Down. And today we are here with Thomas Bjorkman. Thomas is a Swedish entrepreneur, philosopher, and social change maker. Uh, he has a master's degree in physics and also studied macroeconomics on the side. He is the author of three books, The Market Myth, The Nordic Secret, and The World We Create. So Thomas, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for having me on uh, your, your podcast. And I would just immediately add to that in introduction that I'm the co-author of The Nordic Secret together with my friend and philosopher Lena Anderson. Great, great. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll start with the first question. We'll just jump right into there. Sure. So um, I, I was very interested in the concept of Bildung, which of course is kind of like your uh, area of expertise. And I did a lot of research on other definitions of uh, Bildung, but I really like the, the definition that you and your uh, co-author used in The Nordic Secret, which is, uh, I'll just read it here. Bildung is the way that the individual matures and takes upon him or herself ever bigger personal responsibility towards family, friends, fellow citizens, society, humanity, our globe, and the global heritage of our species, while enjoying ever bigger personal, moral, and existential freedoms. It is the enculturation and lifelong learning that forces us to grow and change. It is existential and emotional depth. It is lifelong interaction and struggles with new knowledge, culture, art, science, new perspectives, new people, and new truths. And it is being an active citizen in adulthood. Bildung is a constant process that never ends. I, I just find that really, really an inspiring uh, definition. Yeah, and, and I must give 100% credit for, for that formulation to my co-author, Lena Anderson. I mean, she has expressed that beautifully in, in, in those uh, uh, sen sentences. So yeah, I, I, th I think uh, um, that captures very well uh, our idea of what uh, Bildung could be. And of course, building is an old, uh, it's an old uh, German concept and it has through the, the 200 years when it's been in circulation, been used by many different people with many different uh, uh, understandings of the concept. But Lena and I, we, we go back all the way to the German idealist philosophers who really formulated the first theories on Bildung and coined the term Bildung which doesn't really have a translation into English. Um, it's much more than education. Uh, it's much more than um, um, just formation. It's some sort of, it's, it's a word that expresses a, an organic internal formation and realization of a potential, you could say. And, and that is of course the insight from these German philosophers like Schiller, Goethe, Herder, von Humboldt, Hegel, that our mind is not this sort of rational machine that the Enlightenment philosophers wanted us to believe. So these philosophers re reacted um, very much against the Enlightenment philosophers' view of our mind as a machine. But they said, no, our mind is, is actually an organic system. Today we would call it the self organizing organic system, very much the same way that I know that John Verweke sometimes talks about uh, the, the, the mind as a self-organizing system, uh, that throughout life can find new ways of making meaning of the world. And that when you have these shifts in meaning making, then you are really going from, you could say, one level of consciousness to another or to put it less pretentious perhaps, from one way of making meaning in, in the world to uh, seeing the world in, in a new way. Uh, but as our definition there expresses, it's not just randomly new perspectives of the world. Each of these perspectives brings something of a new freedom to you because you, you can see more things and to use the uh, contemporary developmental psychologist, Professor Robert Keegan's language, what before you were subject to can become an object. Meaning that something that was before an undifferentiated part of your consciousness, you can differentiate it, you can now see it, 
and you can decide what to do with it. And to have an example there of this abstract talking, you, you can look at the young child uh, who's angry. And that anger really has the child. The child cannot relate to its anger. So the anger actually has the child. Whereas a grown up person, you, you can hope, would actually be able to look at its anger and to have its anger and to decide what to do with it. And sometimes it might be the right thing to act it out. And other, in other occasions, it might be the right thing just to observe that now I'm getting really angry, but I need to put this on to the side. And then you have achieved a level of freedom that, that the child has not. And uh, this is just one example, but as we go through this lifelong journey of maturation, more and more things that previously just had us, we can now have. And that gives us um, um, more, more freedom, of course, to, to act. Um, Thomas, so I was, yeah, I was listening to your podcast or your, your TED um, presentation. And you, you mentioned retreat centers, and they, uh, and then you kind of refer to them jokingly as that. Um, are, are those basically like the American version of high schools? No, 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 no. Um, 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 a better comparison might even be SLM. Um, and, and also that comparison is, is a little bit uh, jokingly. So, so what happened, uh, ju just for the listeners to... Uh, to uh, relate to this story. So we are all coming here from, from an integral space, integral understanding or an understanding of the importance of, of lifelong development. I mean, we, we, we in these, around this table are, the, are in this uh, uh, conversation, we take that more or less um, for granted. But of course, in the general society today, we, we, the, the, the concept of lifelong inner development and consciousness development is, is still not very well known nor understood, even if developmental psychologists now have mapped out this development, lifelong developmental journey quite well. So what Lena and I found to our astonishment was that this understanding of the importance of lifelong individual depend, uh, development, the importance of that both for the individual but also for the society, that that was an understanding that was very, very common amongst intellectuals and politicians 150 years ago in Scandinavia. And, and that was the general worldview that everyone in, in an intellectual space was operating uh, in that geographical area 150 years ago. And that was exactly because, of course, in in Scandinavia, German, German was the academic language and the first language we learned back then. And all these intellectuals and politicians actually read the German idealist philosophers. Again, Schiller, Goethe, Herder, von Humboldt, Hegel, in original language. And their understanding of our mind as a lifelong evolving system, that, that was fully understood. And also the way that they these philosophers articulated the relationship between our individual development and societal change and societal evolution and how societal evolution is dependent on the capacity of us as individuals to hold more and more complex cultures, language, thought systems, so, so, so to say. And especially these politicians and intellectuals, they knew that in times of rapid social change, and of course they knew that social change was coming to Scandinavia. They saw both industrialization and urbanization and all of this change is coming. And they were also committed to change the society from being very authoritarian monarchies and introduce the concept of democracy. And they knew that in such turbulent times, it's just so natural for us humans to want to have an outside authority to hold on to. That, that could be a dogmatic religion or an authoritarian leader. But they didn't want to be authoritarian leaders. They, they were firmly committed to building democracy. And they knew 
that the only way to build stable democracies is from bottom up. It's not just a constitutional matter. You really need to build this bottom up for democracy to, to work. And in particular, they knew that already Schiller and Goethe had been talking about this very important step in adult development, where we go from being outside directed and dependent on an outside source or authority, both for our values and our worth, to become what, again, with Professor Robert Keegan's language today, we would call to become self-authoring, to be able to be grounded enough in yourself, to be so well connected with your own inner compass that you can actually guide through turbulence without having to rely on outside gui guidance. So these uh, politicians and intellectuals, they wanted to give the opportunity for many people in our societies to go through that maturation process to find their inner compass, to become self-authoring, and to, be, by that, become what we today might call conscious co-creators of modernity, conscious change agents. And the way that they did that, what was extraordinary, I, I think, because that's where these retreat centers come in. So they actually created a lot of retreat centers in Scandinavia. So by the turn of the last century, year 1900, there were a hundred centers just in Denmark, 75 in Norway, and 150 in Sweden, where young adults later on with full state subsidy could spend six months in retreat, often out in nature, in small groups. There could be 30, 40, 50, 60 people uh, at a special purpose built later on retreat center out in nature uh, where the aim was to at least start on this journey of becoming self-authoring uh, but also to give uh, uh, them an opportunity to learn about new technology and to be able to embrace technological shift and also basic tools for civic work how to write an article, how to argue for your case, how to start a small NGO and so on. So really equip these people, both from a consciousness development point of view, but also with knowledge and tools to really become these conscious co-creators of, of the society. And just to finish on that, that when this was at its height a hundred years ago, then actually 10% of each young generation participated in one of these uh, six months uh, retreats. And, and of course that created what we today would call a critical mass and a, and a tipping point in society, especially since this was not just something for a 10% elite in society. It was not a closed group. These were people from all walks of society and actually a majority of the participants were from farming or working class background. So that's amazing, <laughs> isn't it? And very few people know about this. And even in Scandinavia, we've forgotten about it. That's why we call it the Nordic secret because after the second world war, we shifted our worldview and we, we went back to uh, the worldview that's been dominating in the Anglo-Saxon world of the rational mind, the enlightenment philosophers that locks blank slate or discards mind as a machine. And then, of course, consciousness development uh, doesn't make sense. So today, many even um, historical writers believe that these centers were mostly adult educational centers, which they were not mainly. So you mentioned the... Um, uh... I'm very curious about the the kind of institutional role these centers had. Uh, were they private centers? Were they uh, public institutions? And you mentioned uh, students were subsidized uh, to attend these. And then also historically, when did they begin to fade out of public consciousness in terms of uh, their adaption? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, this all started as a... Um, what we today would call a social entrepreneurship project in Denmark. It, it was a private initiative of some intellectuals who were influenced by the writings of the German idealists, philosophers, and also Kierkegaard, 
but was very influenced himself by the, sorry, the Danish philosopher Kierkegaard, who was himself very much influenced by the German idealist philosophers. And this started in the middle of the 1800s. And this was all financed by philanthropists and shoestring budgets, starting in a farmhouse and spreading like, spreading like that. But then a little bit later, and certainly by the turn of the century, 50 years later, this had become large and, um, uh, and become state financed. And at least speaking from the, the Swedish perspective where we back then had 150 centers like this, the, the beauty when the state come in and sort of saw the value in this. And I must stress that when the state came in and saw the value of, of this, this was sort of an apolitical question. So these, this project was, as a, was actually supported both from the social democratic side, and, and many people associate this with the rise of social democracy and part of, uh, of the people's home idea of, of social democracy. But this was actually equally supported by the liberal side and even the conservative side, because everyone in the political spectrum thought that, yeah, we can compete, about, compete with votes, but we will all benefit if we have a more conscious uh, citizenship, because then our political arguments, we could actually argue and discuss politics instead of just fighting. Uh, and I say, still think that this is very much true. I mean, this is not a political project per se. So you can argue for this, the need of, of lifelong development and maturity. You can argue that from a conservative perspective, you can argue that from a liberal perspective, and you can argue that from a social democratic perspective, the only ones that, that on the political spectrum that would clearly not benefit from this would be the authoritarian uh, populist movements. Because authoritarian populist movements are of, are of course thriving in an environment where, where we are dependent on these external authority for, for, for our confirmation and self-worth and, and, and um, direction. So, so the beauty here was, of course, that we had the support from the whole political spectrum. And what they did was that they actually provided a framework, a financial framework, and an idea framework of the importance of, of this maturation. But the content of these six-month experience, that varied a lot depending on what sort of organization that were responsible for these particular retreat centers. So some were operated by labor unions, others by uh, uh, free church movements, some by sports movements, and some by, uh, I don't know the English word for it, you call them abstinence, uh, when people uh, trying to make don't people have, to drink, yeah. what do you call that? What's the name for? Temperance oh. movement. Temperance mm. is probably it, so temperance movement. So, and others, so there were very many different organizations also running these centers with, with different curriculums but in order to obtain this state finance, you had to have a focus on these personal developmental journey and uh, uh, fostering uh, democratic values and uh, uh, giving civic tools and social society, uh, yeah, society tools and, and, and these things. So it was very modern systemic thinking. So, so, so what they wanted to do, again, using contemporary language was actually that they, was, they were providing a context and a framework to support an evolutionary process and to support the emergence of, of a good uh, modern society. So I think it was very insightful. Uh, and then uh, again, after the Second World War, we, we forgot about uh, this because we changed the world view after after Germany losing two world wars, uh, Ger reading German philosophers were not very popular any, any longer. And with Scandinavia turned towards the Anglo-Saxon world and towards Cambridge and Oxford and the US. And there, of course, again, we, we had still the enlightenment philosophers view of our mind as a rational machine and homo economicus and, 
and all of that. And with that worldview, the importance of consciousness development doesn't really make, uh, make sense. So we started to forget about this. The centers still exist, at least many of them. And we still have a huge state budget in, in the Nordic countries for this called so-called folk building. But nowadays it's mostly used for um, adult education and a, a little bit um, fostering for, uh, for democracy is still there but this develop this clear understanding of uh, our mind as an evolving system and that the evolution of mind can be supported. Th that concept is more or less completely gone now, uh, I would say. That's so fascinating. So I kind of wanted to explore what could be considered a rather you know, dicey or, or thorny issue, which is um, how you and Lena talked about nationalism and the importance yeah. of cultural uh, heritage and history and also contrasted that with patriotism and national chauvinism, which is kind of like yeah. a top five version of nationalism. So I'm wondering if you could just riff on the importance of, you know, understanding our, our cultural uh, heritage and national identity yeah. Yeah. of Bildung and also in doing so, how to prevent that from becoming a toxic uh, chauvinism. Mm, mm. Yeah, no, uh, ab absolutely. Um, and I think this ties in very well with, with just um, ordinary integral thinking uh, today in, in the way that um, Lena and I talk in the book very much about uh, our capacity to hold circles of belonging. So how do we identify the group to which we belong? And as a child, uh, first your circle of belonging is just one, it's just you. And then you can extend that to your family. And then a bit later in life, you include more friends and you might uh, eventually reach a state where uh, you can include all of the people in your country in sort of a circle of belonging. And the original building project in, in the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s, that was very much at the start um, of trying to just expand these sort of farmer children's uh, worldview to not just have their own little village or their clan as the circle of belonging, but really trying to extend that to, to the whole nation. And just that was a project in itself. But I would say definitely uh, a little bit later on in this project, towards the end of the 1800s, or certainly during the beginning of the 1900s, then there was a clear understanding that once you extended your circle of belonging to sort of your, your, your nation, then you need to take the next step and try to extend your circle of belonging to, 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 to the whole of humanity and perhaps even future generations and perhaps even sentient beings. I mean, but yeah, but, but, but having the clear understanding that this is not an easy process. And I think that, that is uh, important and that it is a developmental process. And going back here again to, to the difference between sort of the, the mind of the adolescent and the young adult, um, in uh, Professor Keegan's language, the socialized mind that later can evolve into the self-authoring mind. When you are in a socialized mind, of course you could be socialized into the value of sort of uh, uh, understanding on a cognitive level and, and be socialized into the value of, of being a globalist. But that, as long as you're just there in a socialized mind, as long as that is something that you've been told by your teacher or you are told by your society, then when that outside authority is shifting, you can very quickly lose that. And I think that is what we, you've seen in the US, where a lot of people that used to pay lip service to, to to liberal values, all of a sudden, when when we had President Trump le legitimizing, you know, a, a different worldview, then they said, "Oh, finally, we don't have to think about this shit any longer and talk about this. I I can really go back to my real circle of belonging." Okay, so uh, the building project is not trying to socialize people into an an extended circle of belonging where, where they are not really emotion when they are not really emotionally able to be there on a more fundamental level. 
And in order to extend your circle of belonging to, to include the whole of humanity and possibly future generations, you actually have to go through a number of steps. And I think a very important insight, and I think that is very valuable to, to understand, is that in order for you to, as an adult, to reach out and embrace more and more people and more and more perspectives and more and more views, you need to have very strong roots. So it's the roots you have in your own history, in, in your own locality, in your own family, in your own whatever. The, the firmer you stand on that ground, then the more capacity you have to reach out. If your foundation is very shaky, then it's very difficult for you to, to, uh, to, to expand your, your circles of belonging and you, you, you want to, for, to feel safe, you want to keep a, keep a small, keep a small uh, circle. And I think that, that, that is the brilliant insight by the Bildungs philosophers that you cannot just skip to the global. You have to have also a local anchorage. And that local anchorage back then was very much geographical. Today, I wouldn't say that it doesn't have to be geographical. You can be anchored in, in something else. You can be anchored in a family tradition. You could be anchored in a religion. Uh, you could be anchored in, in, in many different things. But back then, it was very much to be anchored in, your, uh, in the, the, the locality where you came from and, and its history and understanding where you're coming from and, and what you are standing on, so to speak. But, but not for its own sake, but for the purpose of being able to reach out and go out in the world. That's, that's sort of the tension between these two things. Uh, Thomas, in your book, The World We Create, is, um, I see you advocating for Keegan's uh, deliberately developmental culture. Yeah. I was also wondering if you could talk a little bit, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, the Oak Tree Island Escarit. Yeah, perf perfect. And, and, yeah, so and how I'm, actually, the... I'm actually there at the moment. I'm, I'm not usually... Um, staying at our retreat centers, but now I will have uh, uh, quite a lot of activities out here for the next couple of weeks. So I'll, I'll take the opportunity to, to, to show you all what, what the island looks oh, like on nice. the window there. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Very yeah. cool. I was wondering if you can maybe um, take a snapshot of how those two concepts integrate and, and sort of what, what, is, what, what is the purpose of the project? Yeah. So, and when you're talking about the two sides, that's personally in the development. Yeah. Yeah, I'm assuming that the purpose is to sort of build the Bildung in this current environment, I'm assuming. And then also, do you, do you, are you taking measures, efforts to sort of build that sort of culture w within that community? No, no. Uh, 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 abso absolutely. Uh, and I'm, I must say that, you know, uh, Lena and I, we came to this concept of building fairly late. So my background, as you know, is in, um, in business. I, I used to be a serial entrepreneur. I started and built a, a banking business in Scandinavia and in Switzerland, and I s sold my banking business uh, 10 years ago and then had the opportunity to think about what to do with the second half of my life. And I decided that I wanted to set up my own foundation in Stockholm the Oak Island Foundation, Ekfere, and, and to there really concentrate on the relationship between our personal inner development and, and societal change. And back then I hadn't heard about the building concept. So I was fairly surprised when I, five years after starting my foundation and working on this, realized that we actually had this tradition in Scandinavia of really understanding this connection between inner growth and societal change. And what I was trying to do was really just to reinvent the wheel again, so to, so to say, in, Scandin in Scandinavia. Because my input to, or impulse to start this really came from my business experience, uh, understanding the importance when it comes to uh, uh, hiring, but also developing top management in organizations, how important this concept of inner maturity actually is, and also working together with very skin, skillful um, uh, leadership development consultants 
who can actually facilitate this growth. And I participated in, in activities and I had a lot of my colleagues participate in these uh, leadership development uh, activities. And I could see the effect that this had, at least on some of us, and how important that was to be able to function better as a, a top manager, as an executive within a complex moving world. And then I thought, well, if we in the business world, at least part of the business world, understand how important this concept of inner maturity and, and development is, how come we are not talking about that in society at all? Why isn't that part of the aim and curriculum of university education and lifelong education? Why are we only talking about learning facts and skills? Well, why are we not focusing on this, what today some people call the vertical aspect of, of development, instead of just the horizontal learning new skills and, and uh, uh, subjects. So, so that was one starting point. And the other starting point was, again, working with the same uh, business consultants pointing out to, to us how important this culture, corporate culture, is in developing a healthy organization and how, how we could use tools to both see corporate culture and, and also help the development of, of corporate culture. And again, the same way, if we understand how important corporate culture is, especially for large organizations, how come that we are not at all talking about the same in society? I mean, then talking about societal culture and the important for the evolution of societal culture. So that was really my starting point. And, and that is what we have been doing both out on uh, this uh, island where we try to use nature. Again, that, that was my idea long before uh, I heard about these building <laughs> centers because I, I realized myself that where I most easily can connect with deeper layers within myself, that has usually been out in nature, up in the mountains or out in the archipelago. Uh, and uh, I saw the effect nature had on me, the effect nature had on some management teams I've been out in nature with. So I really wanted to explore also the possibility to use nature as a catalyst for, for both individual and, and group processes. So during the summers, we have youth camps uh, all the summer out here. And then the rest of the year, we do things for, for adults retreats, personal development courses, but also we have a few invitational uh, conferences where we gather international e experts and thinkers and practitioners in the field of human development and really try to learn from each other and develop new concepts and, uh, and, and things uh, like that. I just want <clears throat> to emphasize uh, the connection that I'm hearing here because I think in a lot of heated political discussions, uh, especially in today's culture wars, there's a bifurcation between the individual and the uh, collective. And then on the other hand as well, the corporate, right, or the private, and then the public. And what I'm hearing with the concept of Bildung is that it's, it's kind of rhizomatic in this sense of it jumps from the individual self-realization to the, uh, the, the, the cultural flourishing of, a, yeah. of the private sector to the flourishing of the public sector. So yeah. it seems to be a much more holistic orientation towards the social, the individual, and also the corporate, yeah, um, yeah. which is or, why we were excited or, 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 to talk yeah, to you. Or, yeah, or call it the organizational, because back, back then I don't think there was so much corporate interest mm -hmm. as it is today mm -hmm. in, in, in the growth, but it's, it's, cert it's certainly all about uh, individual growth, but not for the sake of the individual. Of course, the individual benefits a lot from, from this in his own or her own career and personal life and everything. But in, at the basis of, of the concept of building is that we, we do this also, and perhaps most importantly, because we then be, become able to in a completely different way contribute to society, but not only to contribute to society, but also to contribute to the evolution of society. And today I would put in this middle layer saying that if we are talking about 
more self-organizing organizations to be able to, to uh, stay competitive in a, in a rapidly changing BUCA world, then of course uh, the individual development of not just the top management in today's corporations, but almost everyone in the corporations are, are key to be able to introduce these things like self-organizing organizations, because you need to have the, 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 cap the capacity and the complexity of, of, your, of your mind to be able to hold the totality of your organization in, uh, in your mind when you take decisions. You cannot just look at your own department or your own uh, work task if you should be able to be self-organizing. So yeah, so this is all really uh, personal development for the benefit of more autonomously functioning organizations and then to be able to contribute to the evolution of society as, as well. So it's a win-win-win situation really. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I'm wondering if you can give some, some more examples of specific methods or techniques that are used to deliberately foster uh, development that maybe some institutions in 2020, like schools and so forth, can adopt to help lead us yeah, through yeah. this developmental journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and again, th th this is not rocket science. Th this is not rocket science at, at all. Um, and, and this is um, something that, that Again, we have been doing in, 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 in Scandinavia for uh, 100, 150 years. And in the US, you have these retreat centers also out in, in nature. Like, for example, my favorite is, is um, the SLN Center, Big Sur in, in, in California, that is also using a beautiful spot in nature to hold these kinds of processes. I mean, these are generally quite... Uh, well known and, and before giving some examples, I must just mention that I, I think of course, and the reason why we do this is that just as a hundred years ago we could see in Scandinavia that we were going through this rapid societal change, of course, I think today with many other thinkers in, in our network that this crisis that we see today, this meta crisis that um, we are uh, at a bifurcation point in societal development. And the best thing we can do at a, such a stage where we will see emergent societal change, meaning that we cannot really plan the societal change, we cannot manage it, but, but we can e increase the odds of taking the upper route at this bifur bifurcation by, for example, um, supporting consciousness development in, in a large, part of, uh, um, of, of the population. And retreat centers, that, that was the poss possibility, only possibility that existed back then. But today, I also believe that we could complement that by using uh, digital platforms. And, and my foundation has got an initiative together with another foundation in Stockholm, the Norsian Foundation, which is a foundation for technology for the common good we have developed a digital platform called 29K. That's 29,000. That's the number of days you have in your life if you live a long life. And our ambition there is to, um, free of charge, because this is um, run by a nonprofit foundation, co-created all open source. So to aggregate a lot of these uh, methodologies for transformative learning, which what you can call this, immersive transformative uh, learning, and to upload them on a platform, make them available for research, and then in a digital format, recreate these sharing circle environments that are so important for, for the personal growth. So uh, I invite you all and all the listeners to check out the 29 k.org um, free platform and there you can see a lot of these techniques and uh, all the techniques that we uh, have on this platform have got uh, scientific research support to actually uh, help on this developmental uh, journey uh, but as i said from the start there 
this is not rocket science. So what is this all about? Well, um, we can just say what, what we are doing at the youth camps and also you doing at adult retreats here at the Ekraret. It's first of all a question of cr creating a, uh, an environment where everyone feels seen, heard, and safe um, enough to be able to uh, uh, really connect to the others in the group uh, on an authentic level. So creating this space of trust is a first prerequisite, otherwise nothing will happen. But then you need to have some sort of challenging element. You need to have some sort of a little bit unsettling ex experience that, that sort of challenges your, your meaning making apparatus, you, you, could, you could say. And um, th these experiences, these immersive experiences, then uh, needs to be digested and you digest them through individual reflection, but also by sharing in this tr trusting uh, environment. So it's, it's all about, as, as with most complex systems evolving, having enough trust and safety for you to dare to let go a little bit of your, of your previous meaning making system, but then these challenges to, to yourself that, that is really creating the, the, the growth. Of course, if you have too much challenges, then you're just shut down. If you don't have trust, you, you are shut down. And, and to tie this a little bit to the development right now, and I know that the, all three of you, you are interested in, in, uh, in uh, what could we do better from, from a, um, uh, a more radical political perspective. And I would say that this, um, culture to, that has developed today in many radical circles of not daring to challenge yourself or not daring to let yourself be, be challenged or offended or not allowing yourself to feel unsettled. That is completely uh, detrimental to any human development and growth. Then of course you will you will just stay as the as the child that you essentially still are when you are eighteen or or or, or twenty. The, the university years the, those are years of challenging, challenging your worldviews, challenging your values, challenging your your hidden assumptions. But of course you need to do that with care, otherwise you just create fear and and shut down. So um, yeah. So th th there is one way I think that we are right now a, a little bit on the wrong, on the wrong track, on, on the more progressive side of the political spectrum right now. Um, I know internationally the Nordic societies have, at least for me, been sort of a, uh, a guiding light as far as for US culture specifically on how we can look to, to better our own nation. Um, in, your, in your book, The World We Create, you, you said the lack of a development psychological perspective was one of Marxism's and socialism's great blind spots. And I think yeah. representing some of the audience um, looking to, for our own labor movement to sort of gain sort of a foothold in I mean, discussing corporate culture of how much uh, the commons is, is separated from the sort of the private um, sector. What recommendations do you have, or what maybe um, insight do you have of your own country of the way a, the labor force can be more represented politically? Mm. Yeah, uh, again, um, if I should, uh, from a Swedish perspective, talk about one force that, that was perhaps the most dominant force in this building process a hundred years ago that would certainly be the labor movement and be the social democrats. As I said before, they were, were absolutely not, not, uh, uh, not alone, but the, the most dominant force were, were the labor union and the, uh, and the social democrats and adapting this perspective of, uh, of personal growth. I, I might qualify a little bit what, what you just quoted from my book that the world we create 
So no, the, the Marxist ideology do not have a developmental perspective on, on us humans. But of course, a, a very important concept for Marx w was the concept of false consciousness. Uh, that, that, that we can actually be socialized into a worldview that, that is not, it's nor correct nor beneficial for our own uh, uh, emancipation. But I think where Marx went wrong, and, and especially the, the implementation of Marxist thinking in the, in the communist system, was that instead of, of viewing the potential of our human development to naturally develop into becoming more inclusive and seeing the world not just in black and white, us and them, right and wrong, but being able to handle more perspectives and paradox and, and nuances, to see the world in a nuanced way. Uh, instead of seeing that way, um, very much that was, was uh, done that to sort of rectify the false consciousness were just to socialize people into a different ideology. And there you're still in the same sort of um, camp. Uh, so uh, just socializing people in, into a, a, a communist thinking or a Marxist thinking and not letting this evolution take its natural course, I think that is a, a, is a huge uh, blind spot. And any progressive movement today uh, to, to, uh, to really have impact in, in this world I think will have to have a, a developmental uh, perspective on the world, which is of course an integral perspective if you want. I mean, the integral perspective is very much um, developmental and, and also be able to, to view the world from all four quadrants. We are so used, and also then if you go back to Marx again, Marx was of course a materialist. So he, he was all in the outer quadrants. Uh, whereas we very easily forget the inner quadrants, our inner personal development, but also the development and evolution of, of, uh, of culture. So, so the best advice I would, would give for the progressive movements today would be to yeah, focus on all quadrants, but also realize that the best way to, to, uh, to move out of a full consciousness is not by uh, indoctrinating someone in, in, a, in a new ideology, but actually helping that person just uh, evolve uh, on the natural lifelong growth uh, journey. Because that growth journey, journey always leads to a more inclusive thinking, a more complex thinking, a more nuanced thinking. Yeah, I just wanted to um, uh, echo uh, uh, a synergy or agreement, and this is something that uh, the uh, the late Michael Brooks, who is a colleague of mine and a friend, and, and very involved in internationalist politics, but particularly from the United States, something we talked about quite a bit, which is the need for any kind of political organization to really incorporate this consciousness dimension. Right? You mentioned. Yeah. Um, having a sense, and I would almost call it resiliency, right? A kind of creative self-transforming resiliency, having a good balance between um, uh, uh, feeling safe and then also having enough of, uh, of a pressure for transformation. And so I think it's a good, it's a good template to, to think about, you know, what, um, well, there's a couple of like subtext here, right? Like I think in the United States, um, the false consciousness that we have is really this sort of lack of uh, a collective imaginary or a social imaginary to go, oh, hey, you know, labor unions could help facilitate some kind of retreat center educational space or build on initiative in the United States to help really encourage people to think in this way, to think in what, you know, peer to peer describes as uh, cosmo localism, which sounds very yeah. similar to what you're saying sure. about Absolutely. the individual yeah. and the collective. Yeah. Yeah. So I think our, our kind of unique challenge here, maybe you can comment on this, is this um, rather than merely indoctrinating folks into Marxism, God forbid, <laughs> um, yeah is really like developing the social consciousness again, or this social yeah. imaginary again. Um, yeah, yeah. So. No, ab absolutely. And, and we shouldn't forget that um, this, co this concept of building and these, the concept of these retreat centers for personal development actually played an important role also in the US. You, you might 
remember from the cover of uh, of Linus and my book, The Nordic Secret, we, we have a, a small picture of Rosa Parks, uh, a mugshot of Rosa Parks on, on the cover of the book. And, and we have that because uh, Rosa Parks has said in many interviews that what made, what gave her the inner strength and the conviction to know that she had a moral right to remain seated on that bus in Alabama and not give it up to that white man uh, even though the law of the land said that she had to do that, was the fact that she had actually spent time at one of these Scandinavian retreat centers. Uh, a, a retreat center built on the Scandinavian model, but in uh, Tennessee, um, uh, called the Highlander Folk School, B because um, uh, an American uh, uh, educational list um, went in the 20s to uh, Denmark, spent a year there and uh, learned this concept, went back to the US and started four centers like this in, in the US and the Highlander Center was, was one of the centers that he, he started. And if you search on YouTube uh, on uh, um, Obama's speech to the Nordic states of heads, heads of states. Um, uh, in, um, at the end of the Obama presidency, uh, he had as um, uh, guests at the White House, the four heads of states of the Scandinavian countries. And then he actually says during his, his speech there that Scandinavia has given a lot of gifts to the, to the world and I'm don't remember exactly what, what gifts he was naming there, but then he said, but a forgotten gift is the concept of the folk schools. And then going on, he even said that had it not been for Miles Horton and the centers, like the Highlander that he created, that he, Barack Obama, would not be standing in front of them as the first black American president. So he even ascribed these sort of centers and the consciousness development effect that had in the civil rights movements in the 50s and early 60s as instrumental for the, for the um, uh, civil rights movement. And Lena and I, we found this clip uh, just before the Nordic secret going uh, it, to print. And we said, oh shit, now Obama is giving away the secret. What, what's this? But Strangely enough, nobody picked up on that in Scandinavia. There were no headlines, nothing, hardly anywhere one understood what he was talking about. So, so interestingly enough, there is a live tradition around this and it was in the US and it was live enough for at least Obama's speechwriter, if not Obama himself, to, to, to pick up on this. So, so you have something there to build on. That's, that's really funny. Yeah. Um, Thomas, I'm, I'm wondering about what your thoughts are on Hansi Freinat, you know, Daniel Gorge and Emil's uh, work and their expression of metamodernism and how your work may, may be similar and how it may be different from theirs. Yeah, so, so um, first I should say I, I'm, I'm a good friend of, uh, of Daniel and, and uh, Emil, uh, and we have been in, in dialogue for, uh, for seven, seven years. And, and um, uh, I invited Daniel to, to stay uh, a year and a half, actually, in my chalet in, in Switzerland while he was uh, doing uh, the bulk of the, of the uh, drafting of the, of the, of the listening uh, uh, society. So there has been an ongoing dialogue um, be between us for, 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 seven, for more than seven years now, I think. And uh, yeah, I'm very, I'm very supportive, of course. I mean, th these uh, thinking and, and what Hansi Freinacht is developing in, in those two books that are out now, and now the third book, um, I understand, is, is soon out. If there is, of course, very much more detailed and very much more uh, revolutionizing th than what I express in, uh, in the world we create. The world we create is, is, I don't claim that to be almost groundbreaking in, in any way. It's mo more my way of, in a pedagogical way, take um, 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 a business person, I would say, I'm, I think I wrote the book 
seeing myself, my younger self as the target group, helping someone that comes from a more orange perspective, scientific perspective, business perspective, and take them on a journey to through the green um, uh, value meme, and then try to take the leap up to a second uh, tier teal or, 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 or yellow thinking. Uh, what I'm adding perhaps in, in the world we create that uh, Hans is not talking so much about is the importance of the collective imaginary, the societal culture aspect, how that is a, the mechanism for, for that evolvement. And in particular, what I consider perhaps the most important aspect of our collective imaginary today, and that is the market and the way that the market has in, in some respects become our new external authority of, after we had God as an authority and then science and then we had a postmodern critique of the scientific narrative and then in this postmodern world where we do not any longer have any have any ultimate authorities that has created a, a, a vacuum an intellectual vacuum where the market has been able to assert a position as the de facto um, uh, central authority of our of our worldview a bit um, uh, paradoxically as of course many if not all of the postmodern philosophers are very critical towards the market it's strange that we in a in a, in a world where dominated by um, postmodern philosophical thinking leading to this sort of relativistic uh, va value vacuum that that would be to the benefit of, of the market. So I discussed that uh, a bit in, in detail, but I, th I think that is the main new contribution in, in that book. Um, the, the Listening uh, uh, Society and the Nordic Ideology uh, are deep books. Um, uh, a bit difficult to read, uh, making a bit, a bit, plugging my, my own book a bit. It could be a good first step to read the world we create be before you read the Listening Society or the, or, or the Nordic um, ideology, just to get a feeling for, for what this is all about, especially if you're not com completely into the integral thinking and, and developmental uh, thinking. But again, yeah, I'm, I'm a great supporter of, 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 of Daniel and Emil. I don't agree with everything that, that, they, that they say, but um, the, the main lines are, 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 are spot on. Uh, just curious, what, what, is the, what are the areas or the main issue of disagreement? Hmm. No, I, I, I think it might more be not, not so much uh, disagreement as um, I, I don't know if, if all the, the detailed reasoning um, uh, around uh, developmental lines and uh, value memes and states and stages and all of that if, if um, of course they, that reasoning is philosophically attractive and I think that is a good model uh, uh, has has this been empirically proven in the way that general consciousness development again along Keegan's line or other lines that uh, that Wilbur mentions in his excellent book integral psychology has actually been empirically proven so that could be one thing I would perhaps separate a little bit more what has been empirically proven and what is more philosophical speculation and good models for, for, your, for your thinking. Uh, perhaps also a little bit just also the, the packaging. Um, I think we have a pedagogical um, task, all of us in this space, and that is how do we meet people out in society that might be very firm anchored in an orange uh, value meme or in a green value meme and and take them to second tier thinking with with all the allergies that could easily uh, develop um, so, so how, how how do you do that and what language do you do that best with towards someone who is sort of in a in a in a business or scientific frame of mind and 
very allergic towards the, the green means of value relativism and inclusiveness and 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 all of uh, and all of that so how do you how do you bring someone to include the green meme and appreciate all the postmodern insights but then still be able to then include that and uh, transcend it so i i, th I think it's more uh, a question of uh, taste and how you how you package how you package this awesome. and also and also i think i i i should say uh, say that and, and uh, i said that a bit 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 uh, uh, jo joking jokingly but this persona of, of hansi freinacht uh, that uh, that appeals very very much to perhaps the the orange male uh, but then to those that the persona ap appeals to, then the message of the importance of the green meme, that, that sort of uh, repels them. And then the other way around, those that understand the green meme and is attractive to the writing of Hansi Freinach because of the green meme, is a bit repelled by uh, this persona <laughs> that is sort of speaking with this very male and authoritarian voice. So, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, these are just... Small, small, small details. It would be surprising if we were all in this space agreeing on everything. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, speaking of education, I was wondering if you had some thoughts on or were familiar with Zach Stein's work on yeah, yeah, modernism. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, and, yes. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I'm in dialogue with, with Zach Stein. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Um, specifically, I'm thinking of, of, of Stein's emphasis, obviously, on, on education and how resonant that is with what you're talking about with Bildung in terms of these learning, these are really learning centers, you know, in terms of the idea that we go there not only to quantitatively learn new information about how to participate in society, but also in that kind of more philosophical sense of mutual transformation, um, uh, transformation of worldview, et cetera. So, um, I guess, I guess my question is, um, as we're wrapping up or getting closer to the, the 90 minute mark here, uh, where do you see this concept of Bildung being applied in the near future? And how do you think it can help us navigate a very particularly acute meta crisis that we're yeah, in right now yeah, between yeah. all the complex problems we have? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, no I'm, absolutely, I'm, I'm a great uh, admirer also of uh, Zach's work and, and writing and, and uh, Zach is working closely with uh, an initiative in London, the Small Research Center Perspectiva that I co-founded together with Jonathan Rousen, who's the director of Perspectiva. Um, and uh, uh, I think he, Zach is very much articulating what, what, what building is today and how this, how we should approach this today. Because I think it's important to, to remember, and that's at least my approach to building and what happened in the Scandinavian countries and what we describe in the Nordic secret, I do not see that as a blueprint. I don't think that that is what we can do today. I think we need to do something different today. But, but it is certainly a case study showing that this emphasis on broad scale personal de development for the evolution of society. That that is not just some academic thoughts or new age thinking, that these ideas have actually been applied in three different countries on broad scale a hundred years ago, and it actually worked. Even if we left this way of thinking perhaps 50 years ago, we are still riding on the momentum that was created back then. So yeah, it's more a case study than a blueprint. So if we now have a case study, what, what, what would the blueprint for today look like? And I think uh, the works of Sachstein, the, the work of John Veveke, the work of many people in this uh, field that are uh, uh, applying not only as we did in Scandinavia back then, the thinking of the German philosophers, but are actually applying the, uh, the, the latest findings, both em empirical finding and other findings 
from developmental psychology right now. And not the least, um, the, the work of Robert Keegan and his colleagues at Harvard U University. And um, as you mentioned before, his ideas about a deliberately developmental organization and how we can create a deliberately developmental organization. And I would take that concept and those findings one step further and say, what we need to create is a deliberately developmental society. A society that has as a priority the realization of the maximum potential and maturation of, of all the, its citizens, wherever they are, for the benefit of the citizens, but also for the benefit of society. Uh, Thomas, in your, um, at the end of The World We Create, you suggest uh, we are in need of a new meta-narrative. Mm. Um, you said a new, um, new meta-narrative might therefore harbor an undertone of post-humanism, a theme that has become frequent, frequent among many contemporary philosophers. And I know Jeremy's uh, into post-humanism, and I was just wondering, uh, what is your perspective on post-humanism and why is that important today? Mm. Yeah. Um... Yeah, first of all, I should, I should say that um, I think that a new meta-narrative will, will be a story of stories. We, we are not moving into one global culture. We are not moving into one, over, uh, one new meta-narrative because the world has become so complex that we need to see the world from many perspectives and we are uh, definitely not just living in a multicultural world. I think we should be encouraging a multicultural world. But to believe that a good multicultural society would just magically emerge from, from putting all these different cultures into to one basket and then waiting to see what happens, that is, of course, naive. You, you need to have some sort of holding space, holding environment, a meta culture you could talk about to hold these, this multicultural society and make sure that the multicultural society brings out the best in the interaction between cultures. So having a meta perspective on culture and also having a meta perspective on meta, on meta narratives, a lot of meta, a lot of meta uh, here. So, so the, 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 the meta narrative will be a narrative around the many stories, the many narratives and, and the, the, the many cultures. Uh, but we need to have some sort of new overarching frame because if we miss that, then we will just end up in, in, uh, in a culture war. And I certainly, I'm, I'm a strong believer in, in the strength of humanity. I'm a strong believer in our possibility to grow as individuals. And if we grow as cultures as well, we will support that growth. But it's also important to realize that we are in a very rapid technological development and the interaction between humans and, and our machines are going to be key for, for the development of, of humanity during the next, already, already decades, so certainly a century if we can look uh, that far. And I think it's very important that we put on the table the discussion about the possibilities, but also the dangers of the possibilities that are opening up on, on the collective um, field when we are taking technology into uh, con consideration. So uh, for better or for worse, uh, the human future will, will be a symbiosis in some way between humans and uh, technology. And I just hope that we will develop the wisdom enough to be able to uh, um, become uh, the ones that are in the driving seats in that uh, evolution. And that we will not all of a sudden just be subject to a runaway technological evolution. It sounds like we're going to need uh, consciously realized creative human beings in order to uh, really inhabit that future world, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. other, otherwise, it, it, won't, it, it, it won't work. No, absolutely yeah. not. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. It, 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 it was a pleasure talking to you all.
Thank you, Thomas. It was uh, very enlightening, and uh, I hope we can stay in touch and continue to have conversations. It sounds like we're in um, a wonderful mutual network, and we have a lot of work to do together. So, certainly, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, bye -bye. Thomas. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye.